Today we gather as people of faith to celebrate astonishing news. World-changing, life-altering, earth-shattering news. He is risen indeed. And each of the Gospels tells the story in a different way. Different witnesses at the tomb, different experiences they report. The details differ, but the emotions are the same. Astonishment, confusion, disbelief at life in the face of death, wonderment, joy. But not for everyone. Not for everyone. Matthew's Gospel plays out a fascinating intrigue in the background of Easter's wondrous events. Let's call it the resurrection resistance movement, if you will. In last week's sermon, you may recall, I spoke of the rising Holy Week conflict between Jesus and the Jerusalem religious authorities, the movers, the shakers, and the power brokers of the temple establishment. He rode into town on Sunday, staking a bold messianic claim and drawing the attention of the gathering Passover throngs. He next caused absolute chaos at the temple, running off the money changers and the sellers of sacrificial animals and doves, and critiquing the entire temple economy, which had come to the point of enriching the powerful and impoverishing the powerless. He taught in the temple courts, challenging and criticizing the religious authorities on their own playing field. And throughout Passover week, they looked for an opportunity to arrest Jesus and kill him because he was threatening both their power and their wealth. Thursday night, they arrested him. Friday morning, they tried him in the religious high council, and since the religious law did not give them grounds for the death penalty, they dragged Jesus before Pilate, the Roman governor, and demanded his crucifixion. And Pilate, exasperated and perplexed, washed his hands of it all, and by Friday afternoon, Jesus was crucified, his body placed in a borrowed tomb. But then, on Saturday, the Sabbath day and the day of Passover itself, the same authorities are back before Pilate once more. He thought he had washed his hands of it all. Now these same old, frightened, power-hungry men want to set a guard on the tomb of a dead man. They want to be certain that Jesus is not merely dead, but really most sincerely dead. Now this is important. So let's open our eyes and perk up our ears. What the religious authorities are seeking here is control of the narrative. Jesus said he would rise, whatever he meant by that, and that would ruin it all. Remember, Jesus was a powerful critic, not of Judaism itself, nor of the practitioners of the Jewish faith. Recall Jesus himself was a faithful, observant Jew. But he was a harsh critic of the religious powers that be, the temple authorities, the scribes, the Pharisees. And he had called them out for the way in which they had allied faith in God with the all too earthly trappings of power and wealth and empire, pursuing self-interest over God's interest. Jesus was saying, in effect, you have influence and authority Use them for something other than furthering your influence and authority. And his entire temple protest had been about calling them out for acting religious, but neglecting justice and mercy and compassion and the values of the kingdom of God. And the kingdom that Jesus proclaimed of compassion and forgiveness, of debt remission, of the last becoming first and the first becoming last, and the powerful being brought down from their thrones, Turns out the powerful didn't like it. They tried to make Jesus and his followers be quiet, and he told, he told them, if these were silent or silenced, the very stones would cry out. Well now, their mission accomplished, and Jesus dead in the tomb, they feel that they stand vindicated. 
And they want to be sure that not only Jesus, but his entire Kingdom of Heaven movement is silenced. Protect the body, guard the tomb, control the narrative, he was wrong, now he's gone, move along, nothing to see. But if there were no body, they'd lose the narrative. Jesus, his way, his work, his followers, his teaching, the nature of God that he both proclaimed and embodied would be revealed as truth. And they would be put to the lie. He said he would rise on the third day. His opponents must see to it that not even the appearance of that is possible. If he rises, we fall. If he triumphs, we fail, is what they might say. Seems to me the whole situation is poetically described in John chapter 3. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and some people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. So they're back before Pilate. These old men now seeking hired muscle. I can almost imagine Pilate face palming himself as he says, fine, you have a guard of soldiers Go make it as secure as you can. What a curious choice of words. Go and make it as secure as you can. And that sets the scene for a miracle. And here's the amazing part, the unbelievable part, the inexplicable part. Matthew writes, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. This is earth shattering. This is going to shake everything up. And an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the sto stone and sat on it. I love that little detail. Just sat on it like... What you gonna do now, resurrection resistance movement? There's no stopping the sunrise. For fear of him, the guards, who in fairness had been making it as secure as they could, shook and became like dead men. And disregarding them altogether, the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified, He's not here. He has been raised as he said. Come and see where the body was, but is no more. Now what does this mean exactly? It means there's a new narrative. An Easter narrative, a resurrection narrative. Power doesn't get to call the shots. Violence doesn't get to call the shots. Empire doesn't get to call the shots. Even death itself doesn't get to call the shots. Compassion and grace and forgiveness and mercy and love and life call the shots. And the cross, which only recently seemed to be the ultimate symbol of failure and despair and loss, is rendered powerless and its message is transformed entirely. In the words of the Apostle Paul, death is swallowed up in victory. And if we need not fear even death, then what earthly power holds any fear or any ultimate authority? The angel says to the women, Tell the disciples he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. And then, wonder of wonders, they encounter Jesus himself who says, and I love this detail too, greetings. How you doing? And he repeats the message. Tell my disciples to go to Galilee where they will see me. Now what happens next is all too predictable. 
It's what power and evil and empire ever seek to do. Regain control of the narrative. Even as the women are going to tell the disciples they're on their way, they just left. Some of the guards are going into the city to tell the old, frightened, power-hungry men what has happened. And the power-hungry men open up their purse strings because with enough money you can make things happen and they give a bunch of money to the soldiers and they say, tell this lie. Spread this fake news. Gaslight, obfuscate, prevaricate, distract. You must say, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this comes to the governor's ears, we'll satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. We'll handle the politics of it. You just spread the lie. It's not even a very good lie. John Wesley, in a commentary, says, Is it possible that any man of sense should digest this poor, shallow inconsistency? If you were awake, why did you let the disciples steal him? If you were asleep, how do you know that they did? But a lie doesn't have to be good. Just tell it with conviction and spread it with energy and people will believe it. They'll believe that the election was rigged. They'll believe that the war in Ukraine is a peacekeeping mission. All you need is a big enough megaphone and a cynical group of people willing to peddle fake news and falsehoods to a credulous public. The resurrection never happened. The body was stolen. So what do we have now? We have a narrative. He is risen indeed, grace wins, death has no sting, hope springs eternal, love conquers all. And we have the resurrection resistant movement's counter narrative. Empire wins, money wins, power wins, death wins, everyone for themselves, move along from the empty tomb, there's nothing to see. The devil is ever a peddler of lies and a promiser of power. What does the risen Christ do? He calls together the 11 remaining disciples, such a small group in the face of such a big lie, and he says, be my witnesses. There is an energetic and cynical counter-narrative being spread that power and wealth and death and empire hold sway in the world. You go proclaim life. You go proclaim peace. You go proclaim grace. You go com proclaim compassion. You go proclaim mercy. You go proclaim justice. You go proclaim Easter and proclaim it to the ends of the earth and proclaim it to the end of time and proclaim it when no one is listening and proclaim it when the tanks are rolling and proclaim it when the dictators are dictating. You must proclaim Easter and resurrection and life as energetically as they are proclaiming lies and death. And it won't be easy. And it will often seem discouraging. And it will seem that they have the money, and they have the power, and they have the influence, and they pull the strings, but you have one thing that they will never have. The truth. The ultimate truth. And the truth is this. Love wins. You cannot stop the sunrise, not with a guard of soldiers, not with a pack of lies. There's no denying the dawn and the resurrection resistance movement is doomed to failure. He is risen indeed, and that changes everything forever. Amen.